real um, pleasure for me to introduce uh, Anne, Anne Graybill. Uh, Anne, uh, Anne did her master's in biology at Tufts, and then she did a PhD at MIT, and shortly after that she was recruited to the faculty there, and she spent her career there. She's uh, an institute professor and an investigator uh, in the McGovern Institute as well as the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, Anne has uh, received enough awards that I could stand up here and, and prevent her from giving her lecture by listing them all. Um, these are marked by uh, uh, the National uh, Medal of Science, a Cavalli Prize. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National uh, uh, Academy of Medicine, and the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, this, of course, should indicate that Anne is a real pioneer, and that is really the case. She's a pioneer in neuroscience in many, many different ways. Uh, she's been an absolute fundamental contributor to her understanding of the basal ganglia and how the striatum uh, within the basal ganglia facilitates <coughs> movement, learning, actions, habits, and decision making. Everything that she does is really on, on the cutting edge. I would say her work is sort of the, the cutting edge of neuroscience uh, uh, generally, and especially within the basal ganglia. Anne's work has broad ranging implications in both health and disease. Uh, on a personal note, Anne probably doesn't know this, but she's provided for me periodic reinforcement since the time I was a graduate student. Sometimes with very few, but really very encouraging words, and each time they propelled me, propelled me uh, forward, and, and I know I'm not alone in, in receiving that reinforcement. Anne and I have been going to some of the same conferences recently, and what I've noticed is that she always sits in the front, and she takes copious notes, really vigorous copious notes, and if you sit close enough to her, you might hear her mumble, wow, beautiful. <laughs> Sometimes she'll even gasp when she sees, when she sees data that she finds uh, uh, exciting. She did this recently when one of my students was giving a talk at a meeting in Oxford, and this student has not yet come down from that high. <laughs> Made her feel very good, and me too. Um, what this really shows, I think, is that Anne has this persistent wonder um, almost childlike wonder and passion for science, and, and uh, it's really beautiful, and you can see this obviously uh, in her work, and I'm sure you'll see it in her, in her talk today. So uh, please join me in welcoming Anne Andrew. Anne, thank you. How's this? Good, okay, thank you. So I had meant to start um, by a subject that I think interests all of us, which is the almost miracle that we can go from intending something to actually doing it. Uh, it almost is uh, impossible to imagine how we can do this. And we know that our motivation has a huge influence on, on this intention action uh, system. And of course, in the end, it produces movement and thought. And over time, the basal ganglia have become recognized as being implicated in this. You can see the tip of the caudate nucleus here uh, in a PET scan. And what our field has found uh, is actually a wonderment in the fact that basal ganglia circuits turn out to be not only uh, important for the extrapyramidal motor uh, disorders and the cognitive and emotional signs that unfortunately go with these, often prodromal to these problems, but we've been struck by the uh, range, really, of implications of the stridum, and especially these pathways in a, a range of neuropsychiatric disorders. And I know that you know here about a lot about this and the fact that in more unaffected people, uh, our habits, our repetitive behaviors, our rituals, I'm extremely interested in that, and even addictions somehow are the system is mixed up in all of that. So what the field has also come to think is that these 
cortico-striatal loops are important for selecting what we'll do. What do we do next? What do we do next? And it's a very old, old system, evolutionarily speaking, it's thought. And so it, this system, these pathways can project, project down to motor, motor pattern generators in the brainstem and spinal cord by direct and indirect pathways. And they have this system uh, carrying dopamine up to the striatum, which is important for reinforcement, for impetus for action, as people are now talking about. So these are terribly important uh, systems, not terribly, but wonderfully important systems in our brain. But along with those, uh, there is this other set of pathways that start out in parts of the cortex that people think is related to kind of value evaluation, mood, affect, disordered in a lot of affective disorders. And this pathway, some part of this pathway, projects down to the striatum to special regions in the striatum that are neurochemically specialized. And the reason that uh, one emphasizes these is that these zones, which we years ago called uh, striosomes or striatal bodies, like ribosomes and all of those, anyway, these can project down directly to the dopamine-containing neurons of the striatum. And in fact, they are thought to provide the majority of input to the dopamine-containing neurons directly and then indirectly through this wonderful little lateral habenula, which indirectly has access to the dopamine and serotonin systems. So this could be very powerful to affect these modulators, which in turn can affect the forebrain. Uh, over the years, I've been so lucky uh, to have people who were interested to work with us on how habits are made, how they're broken, uh, aspects, detailed aspects of how they're formed. And we also um, have done studies mainly with optogenetics once that finally came along to, to, to break habits optogenetically, to make them uh, unavailable for performance or to bring them back. This is studies that, among others, we did with Kyle Smith, who's here. And here with Eric Bigger, we, we worked with compulsions and could stop those compulsions while leaving other behavior intact. Now, a lot of these studies, uh, we were very inspired by Jim McGraw, started with T mazes. I came from biology, but I knew in psychology that T mazes were really important. So we were very new to this, and we plunged a bunch of tetrodes into the stride, and we thought, well, we might get motor behavior to, to make the cells active. No one had done this before in alert animals moving around. And so we put those tetrodes in the sensory motor part of the striatum, now lovingly called the dorsolateral striatum in rats and mice, and looked to see how the cells behaved. And they had a nice learning curve, these animals. It took quite a long time to learn this task. And importantly, we gave them cues, at first auditory, later uh, tactile, telling them whether reward be, were on the right and left. And this is what we found here um, from the work of Tara Barnes and Katie Thorne. Here is Kyle about the same thing in different sets of tasks. Task time is shown at the top. Here's morning cue, gate opening, start, go up, up to goal. These are learning stages going down. The arrow points to a chi-square criterion for learning, 72.5 correct. Here you can see the um, percent correct. Here you can see the run times uh, across time. So we saw this over and over. And the idea came that maybe what's happening in this part of the striatum is that when we, do a, when we perform a behavior, when we make a series of acts, then through the stream of our behavior, there are episodes that are particularly valuable to us. And then we, we mark those episodes that are, that are good for us 
through this learning system, we mark them at the beginning and the end. So that's an interesting idea, <laughs> um, we thought. But we didn't know whether this would happen naturally if we weren't training animals. And so an extremely courageous uh, grad student and I, Teresa de Rosers, uh, decided that we would take monkeys and cats, put them in front of a computer screen, and the monkeys first saw uh, four green dots. Now I'm going to show you nine green dots a little later. I hope you can see this with the lights on. And unbeknownst to the monkey, well, the monkeys like to look around just like people, so they started scanning around on these dots. But uh, what they didn't know is that uh, at random, there would be, if they, their gaze fell on a dot, they would get a reward. So the reward could come anywhere. And we didn't train them. All we did was stuff them in a little box. We gently put them in the box, left them alone. They could sleep. They could do anything they wanted. But because of this random reward, they looked around. And I'm showing you now the traces that we recorded from not the beginning of training, but kind of early in the training. And I want you to look and see that, gosh, they're, uh, they kind of go all over. And now I'd like to show you the same monkey doing the task um, later during this exposure. We ran monkeys 60 days, 120 days, and Teresa was recording every day. It's quite, a, quite an experiment. Now this is the same monkey doing his little untrained task. And I hope you notice that it's, he's a little machine now. Just absolutely, we were stunned by this, even though I know that a lot of people knew that things get more regular, we were still stunned. And then we looked at the, uh, oh, I should be pointing, I'm sorry. We looked at the, uh, I wonder if I can point with this thing. Can you see my cursor? Can you see it on both sides? Okay. <laughs> Now let's see if I'm coordinated enough to do this. So what we found, these are uh, traces through learning from top to bottom, and we're showing uh, activity again in uh, blue is low and red is high. And you'll see that over training, eventually the same kind of beginning and end pattern occurred. This monkey was not trained. And another very interesting thing is that the patterns that, of trajectories kind of changed over time. This is pretty early for monkey G, and he does a lot of this pattern, probably because he used to do a, a four green dot test. But then he kind of stopped doing that. This is over the days. This is 60 days. Then he kind of did this one for a while. He dropped it. Then he sort of did this one as his favorite, and then this one is his favorite, until he did this one kind of late. But you can see the ramp up. And it just so happens, you saw this pattern, just so happens that this pattern is an optimal pattern for going around nine dots with the least time and in the least distance. So we were very impressed by this, and we were very impressed by how sharp that end pattern got. In fact, we measured its entropy, red is early and blue is late, and it fell, fell, fell. And we looked at what kinds of cells were active, or what they were seemed to be related to at the end. And we found uh, through this regression analysis that some were uh, most sensitive to cost. In other words, if the next trial was a little longer than the other one, that's a cost. Some of them were related to outcome, whether they got eventually a reward. And this uh, made us very interested in cost and utility. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually will be about that. But right now, we should say that when it, at least an animal learns a habit, at least rats and monkeys and mice form these bracketing patterns. I don't have time to talk about it, but time seems to be embedded in these representations that can occur without explicit training, I just showed you that, they can reach optimality. There are these integrated cost-benefit signals uh, that mark uh, 
highly uh, optimal performance. I don't have time to talk about the fact that different loops of corticostriatal basal ganglia uh, uh, circuits have different patterns. And then finally, losing my cursor, uh, striatal and hippocampal phase activities can become anti-correlated. It's only one experiment that's fascinating. I'm sorry I don't have time. And the reason I don't have time is that I'd like to tell you now, uh, well, I'd like to ask the question with you about, OK, these things happen, but how is the decision made? Who's making the decision, and what is, what's going on in the brain? And for that, we had to have, I keep losing my pointer, my cursor. There it is. Uh, we had to have a task. And we decided to use an approach avoidance task. And you can see that here very vividly. Here he is trying to figure out whether to run or to stay, whether to approach or to avoid. And you can see that his friends here have already made the decision they're getting out of here. So this is a very, very ancient kind of behavior, very elementary, required behavior, actually, for, for life, for living. It's then a core uh, part of our behavior. And I was especially interested, and our lab was interested, in the fact that this kind of decision making is vulnerable in states of anxiety and depression. So Kenichi Amamori came to the lab wonderfully, and we set up a task in which we could vary the cost to the animal, we could vary the benefit, and we showed symbols that indicated cost and benefit. We showed them together. I'm going to show you the task in a minute. So we could have different combinations of cost and benefit. And as a result, we could actually plot the avoids, which are squares, the approaches, which came after a delay period. Uh, we could show them with the crosses. For example, here is high cost, low reward. So it's a square, he avoids. Here is high reward, uh, low cost, the approaches. And the, and the neat thing is then we could actually calculate a decision boundary so you begin to get numbers. And so then what we decided to do, and this is the whole point, was to see whether we could, by these are monkeys, microstimulate. Now we use optogenetics and rodents. Could we microstimulate and get a change in this decision boundary? And so we decided to start with that evaluation pathway and start uh, with stimulating the neocortex and then, uh, in very recent experiments, we went down to the striatum. We were aiming, and we never could do this yet in the monkey, but I hope we're close. Whoops, I'm sorry. We were aiming for striosomes. We've done, I hope we're doing that now in the rodents, as I'll show you. But I thought many of you have never heard of striosomes. So here they are in red. Uh, they're labyrinth labyrinthine regions. Uh, in the striatum, which I said, are neurochemically specialized, and they happen to be in this pathway. So here, years ago, with Frank Eblen, we had looked with old-fashioned methods at what pieces of cortex do project striosomes. And we uh, made classical uh, tracer studies, injecting lots of the medial wall and orbital frontal cortex. And Frank and I found that it was these blue regions, perigenual anterior cingulate and caudal orbital frontal cortex. You have seen pictures of these regions light up in slides at this meeting. It's remarkable. And these regions did preferentially project to striosomes. So we decided this is extremely interesting because those regions were known and increasingly known to be related to the amygdala, to the hippocampus to uh, mediodorsal nucleus of the thalamus. And moreover, as I said, they are uh, regions, we can't say exactly the same regions, but in uh, people uh, who have depression, here's perigenual, pregenual ACC. There are many such studies. This is from Pizzigalli. Here's a person craving cocaine. 
uh, orbital frontal lights up simultaneously. Your vocal and others have studied this. And so I'm going to show you the task quickly. Uh, we really should have less light. But we'll, let's muscle on. If you can see this at all, um, the monkey sees, as I said, a combined uh, stimulus, and then there's so a decision period, one and a half seconds, then a delay period, and then he's going to move a cursor to go to approach or avoid by, by moving to symbols which are randomly varied in their position. And I'm showing you this uh, kind of the neutral position, one red equals two uh, yellow. One, one length of reward is two lengths of yellow. So here he goes. He's going to get a very favorable offer. It's almost all reward. And you can see the plus. He went there. The next one will show an awful uh, offer. Remember, that's two to one. And now we'll show you one right at the decision boundary. It's a long delay. And finally, he chooses. So uh, with that task, uh, we then did the microstimulation aiming for the blue region. And we did that by first recording. Ken is really a fabulous. Uh, and going down the meteor wall, we found a zone where there were more avoidance units. We called them negative units and positive units. And then heroic Ken went down, down, down to microstimulate. And I want to tell you that these black dots mean nothing. So can you imagine how long this took? And my hat's off to Ken. But finally, one day, we all gathered in the lab because here the sites were effective in changing the decision boundary. And they all changed it uh, toward more avoidance, as though the future was thought by the monkeys to be worse than it really would be. This effect was blocked, uh, dose dependently, by anxiolytics, for example, diazepam. We had a task we carried along, approach, approach, so both yellow and red meant food of different amounts. No effect of microstimulation. And new data from uh, uh, Satoko Aosaki has confirmed, indeed, a behaviorally defined hotspot can project predominantly to stresomes. So we've uh, begun a study in humans where we've uh, been lucky to work with the group of Diego Pizzigali. This is very, very early in the study. But the, the nice thing is that we're using the identical stimuli uh, in the humans as we use for the macaques, so the two bars. And we have uh, only begun to analyze the data. Ken is heavily involved in that. But I think you'll notice this pregenual region lighting up in the subjects, uh, and it's tracking the, so far, the subjective aversiveness of the offer. So we think we're now going to be able, we really hope, to relate the monkey work to the human work which we all care about so much. Now, I want to tell you one quickly one other experiment that we're doing, also spearheaded by Ken and Satoko Amamori. We went down to the caudate nucleus. Um, and as I said, we can't really identify stresomes yet, although I think Simon Hong in the lab may be getting that. But I want to show you here. This is a stimulation session. So this is stimulation off for a couple hundred trials stimulation on for a couple hundred trials, and then off again for an equivalent number of trials. You can see the red avoids. You can see here, with the stimulation on, a noticeable increase, a calculable increase. These are the statistics at the bottom. And then here, the stimulator is off, and uh, there are even more avoids. Well, we were surprised by that. So we went back the next day. The whole Everybody in the lab was there. But, but quiet. And there was no stimulation at all this day. And the monkey mainly avoided. We we're actually almost frightened by this. We went on to the next day. And by the next day, this resolved. And I think if you look at this decision matrix, it's almost the same as this one. So somehow, we had a persistent effect. We don't know how long this can go on. With one spot, we got it to five days, and we just stopped. This is also blocked by diazepam. 
There's absolutely no effect that we can detect in the approach-approach task. And the persistence to the next session, we only found for negative effective sites, I failed to tell you that we have a whole map of sites. Some produce increased approach, and some produce increased avoidance. Uh, if we do econometrics modeling, which we like to do in our lab and look at utility and all, uh, it does look as though we get uh, a change in the cost-benefit ratio. Uh, we wonder whether these are mood states. We absolutely know that these are only proxy states. We're in a macaque. We can't talk to him. But maybe they're proxy states for pessimistic decision-making, maybe even for anxiety and depression. And it's interesting, and I'm so sorry that, you know, there's limited time. We think we've found a kind of beta band activity that may indicate uh, this change in the cost-benefit ratio and, and actually also the degree of repetitiveness of the, the behavior quite aside from the number of avoids. So, well, uh, to get a mechanism, we had to go to rodents. We couldn't do that kind of experiment exactly in rodents, but so what we did is we cut down to a binary choice situation, and it so happens that rats and, and um, mice, which we now use a lot of, they hate bright light. So Alexander Friedman uh, put bright light shining right down on a food port, and in the food port uh, was pure chocolate. They just adore it, and they'll work forever for it. On the other side, they, uh, the animal could choose dim light. He doesn't mind that at all. But the cost was that the milk was diluted, such so diluted chocolate milk. And here's just to show you for fun the benefit. Benefit, pure chocolate, diluted, and we had different levels of dilution. The key was we had to uh, we had find a little zone in the rat and mouse, little zone of the prefrontal cortex that preferentially projected the striosomes, and here you can see in green uh, virally labeled fibers that are actually carrying cargo down to the striatum. This is a standard marker for striosomes. You're looking at a little bit of a cross-section of the uh, dorsomedial striatum. So these little red things are striosomes. And you can see the fibers look like they're matching. And here actually is a merge of the two images, and you can see. So this is pretty much preferentially uh, projection of the striosomes. So this gave us now, some, uh, some way to change this pathway selectively, because we can go down and put the optogenetic excitation or inhibition through a laser, put it onto the, the terminals in the strider. So we, were, we knew we were working on this pathway. So we started uh, by stimulating it. And uh, here, the laser is off. As I told you, the animals love to go to the dim light side, wouldn't you? Um, but this is what happened when we turned the laser on. We got a very large increase in approaches to what, for all the world, I'm losing my pointer again. Can you see it? Can anybody see it? Uh oh. <laughs> anyway, hmm. Why can't you see the pointer? But oh, there. Okay, it just comes and goes. Anyway, I'm sorry to break it up. They go a lot more to the bright light, high reward side. And we found something that really stunned us. We had absolutely no idea that this would be true. Uh, and that is that this was very selective for the cost benefit task. So here you can see the increase. Um, nothing's working here. An increase in uh, going to the pure chocolate side, okay, for the cost-benefit task. But here, for two different benefit-benefit tasks and no, no, conf no conflict cost-benefit task, there was no effect. So we decided we better microstimulate a region of the cortex that projected to the matrix. And so here it works again. So we did that. You can see the uh, green fibers coming down from the cortex. Look at the little holes. They pretty much exactly uh, leave out the striosomes. Look at the merge. And look at the behavior. Suddenly now, when we get outside of the striosomes, 
all the different tasks are affected. So this, uh, this was interesting. So what we did, and this is thanks to Houdan and Alexander and some others in the lab, the effort was to antidromically and orthodromically identify, and that was hard, uh, cortical cells that projected to the striosomes and the striosomal cells as best we could. Here, again, red means a lot of firing. And what we found is that the identified uh, peripheral neurons, we call them PL, CPLS cells, they, uh, come on, cursor. We need to improve the pointers in this room. It's just not working. But anyway, I'm sorry if I can't show on both sides. But anyway, you can see that in these neurons, at about the time that, that the animal has to execute the choice, there's a lot of activity in the cost-benefit test, but not in the benefit-benefit. And here is a histogram showing that this is highly selective for the neocortex, cells that are projecting down. But so that's a glutamatergic so-called excitatory pathway. And yet when we looked at the striosomes, with, uh, we found that they were almost silent. And in fact, if you look at the histogram, it was just about the opposite of the activity profiles of the cortical neurons projecting down to those very neurons. So we thought and we thought, and we experimented and we experimented, and we finally got enough recordings from the rare fast firing neurons of the striatum. And we found that they were alive with activity. And in fact, their activity across the tasks looked very much like the activity of the cortical cells that had been antidromically identified. So what we think is going on, and we find it very interesting, is that especially conditionally in the cost-benefit task, this cortical pathway is turned on. It projects down to the striatum. Here you can see a little bit of data. Here's the firing rate of one spiny neuron, projection neuron in the striatum, ticking along at about four hertz or so. Simultaneously, this high-firing neuron was recorded. And you can see it begins to fire more. We've marked uh, the rise time and the peak of that activity. And by the time it reaches the peak, this projection neuron has gone silent. So what we think is, yes, the cortex is going down, trying hard. It's yelling at the spiny neurons. But they can't hear because this uh, inhibition is just a little bit faster. And when I say a little bit, I mean a little bit, as I may go on and show you. Well, actually, you can see it here. So again, we tried to do modeling. And again, we feel that there is this something special about the integration of cost and benefit. So we wonder whether this could be related to state, whatever that means. I had a hard time with the word state, but I'm actually beginning to be quite interested in that term. And so what we did to try to get some, at least beginning at looking at state, we decided we would uh, stress the animals mildly. So we had never done that before. So we either uh, immobilized them gently in a little container for two weeks, just an hour a day, or we gave them very, very mild foot shock for an hour a day for two days, or uh, two weeks, I'm sorry, oh, that was two weeks, whereupon we began the experiment that you've already seen. And so here's the cost-benefit task, here's the benefit-benefit task. And normally, as you know, in the cost-benefit task, uh, the animals prefer to go here. And the stressed animals tended to go the other way. And in fact, to our absolute amazement, we could not tell the difference between the behavior <laughs> this is so funny. I don't know, was that the Lord? I mean, <laughs> anyway, I, I, it's such an important point. I'm going to repeat it. We could not tell the difference when we looked at the behavioral plots 
between a stressed animal, just a brief period of stress, chronic, the thing is chronic stress, and an animal whose cortical mainly striosomal pathway, had been optogenetically inhibited. This was, this turned us on. And so here are the data for <clears throat> the reduction of going to the uh, safe side. That's for immobilization. Here's for foot shock, very similar. So we decided to do the following. We decided that we needed to go parametric on this to see whether it really had something to do with integration of cost and benefit. So what I'm showing you here is our, our behavioral data showing the choice of diluted chocolate milk, so it's dim light. And all we did in RAT9 was bit by bit by bit, we increased the dilution, I mean the uh, concentration of the diluted milk. So like a rational rat, as the stuff became more concentrated, why on earth would you go to the bright light if you get almost as much chocolate by going to the other side, until finally they were almost always going there. And now I want to show you what happened to the stressed animal. This stressed animal just kept going a lot to the bright light side, and, whoops, until suddenly he changed. I'm showing you another rat behavior of another rat, same thing. And here they all are. And so it looks as though we've changed the state transition. Uh, if there's a shift in the integration of cost and benefit, that this is somehow abnormal, and there are these abrupt transitions. And so we wonder, obviously, you know, how does this happen? Um, in science, isn't it wonderful that you do one experiment and then what happens? You get another question. You do the experiment. You get another. It's just the coolest thing. So, so we had then to go back and do a lot of antidromic, orthodromic, and all of that. And so we recorded. And here, in an unstressed animal, we, we recorded and stressed and recorded, or we recorded no stress and recorded. It took many, many animals. So in a control animal, you already know this. Uh, in the cost-benefit test, striosomes are bizarrely quiet. And here's what we found when an animal had been immobilized, but nothing more. Suddenly, that execution of the decision period lit up. The cells were extremely active. So the striosomes normally, in this kind of test, are quiet. But if the animal is stressed, they are turned on, and boy, are they turned on. So we looked uh, again at the intrinsic circuitry, and what we found was that what stress does, among others, of course it involves many parts of the brain, but we're looking at identified pathways, it changes the dynamics by changing the cortical input and the interneurons. So it changes the activity toward firing activity of the striosomes, which project to the dopamine containing neurons, and the behavior comes out. And what's happening, we think, or what we actually know, is that these high firing neurons, they are firing. They fire like mad, but they fire just a little bit too late, just after the decision. So the decision has been made, and that means the cortical input can come in and directly activate the striosomes. So it is a kind of change in EI balance, but boy, is it context dependent. So our conclusion here on this part is that this is, this is a highly delicate system, just a tiny little bit of change in the local circuitry or the long distance circuitry. Tiny bit of change in timing can have profound effects on our behavior. We also think that because I'm not going to go into them, we have some causal evidence by uh, exciting or inhibiting uh, the uh, high firing neurons. We have to call them PV neurons in this case, parvovirin neurons. But we can either block the effects of stress or we can mimic them, and we're excited about that. But again, the question is okay, all this happens, but so what and what happens? What's the output? And so 
what we did, of course, we had not many ways to see stereosomes or work on them. That's why it took so long. So I decided to try to do uh, fate mapping. And I'd found a long time ago that stereosomes are born very early. That means the progenitors had made their decision to uh, their neurogenetic decision. And so we used, with uh, the help of Josh Wine, who's a real expert in this, um, uh, driver lines where we could uh, drive uh, to pre-ER, so we could drive the estrogen receptor into the cells. And we did this early in development, and then you're looking now at 28, you're a 28 day old mouse, and you can see uh, preferential labeling of stereosomes. Here are spines to show you their spiny neurons. If we did this a little later during development, we mainly um, labeled the matrix. And we're doing a bunch of things with these animals. I want to end with this and some other animals that we've engineered. But uh, one thing that we absolutely are stunned by is this beautiful bouquet. If what you're looking at here, I just wish the lights were off. It is so beautiful. I feel like going like that. <laughs> um, it really is. I mean, uh, I always keep a picture of this nearby to, for inspiration, but <clears throat> there's no way to turn the lights down. But anyway, it is a beautiful bouquet. The red flowers at the top are actually dopamine-containing fibers. It's a real blow-up of the substantia nigra. And down here, the bouquet stem. Uh, some of these dopamine neurons we found tend to bundle their dendrites. So there may be 15, 18, 20 or more uh, dendrites that are like this. Oh, thank you so much. Isn't that pretty? And um, if we look high power by using the, the, the day we found this, I ran to Ed Boyden because he had just uh, developed expansion microscopy. So this is now a little bit better way to look. And you can, here you can see um, the dopamine containing dendrites in red just intertwined with fibers that have come down from the striosomes. This is a striosome, I showed you the kind of mouse, and it's a uh, DAT-free dopamine mouse. So there, there you have it. We have this incredible outflow from striosomes that just absolutely hit the dopamine-containing uh, neuron clusters that have the uh, bouquets. So the last thing I want to say is that another way we've uh, been able to take advantage of these mice is that finally, 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 for the first time, where's my cursor, we can see striosomes with two photon microscopy. I'll do that once again. The way we can identify them is that there's lots of neuropils, so we see patches. We literally see that. And here you see with calcium imaging uh, activation of those uh, in a very, very simple, we just started simple, we're getting more complicated now, uh, 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 auditory uh, probabilistic task where the tones uh, mean different probabilities of reward. And it's early, early days, but we do know that stereosomes relative to matrix, it is the first time that people could record uh, both at the same time with some surety, because, thanks to this neuropil. Uh, they're, they're very affected by learning. Uh, they're more sensitive to the cues predicting reward. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with uh, matrix activity, as you might have guessed from the earlier work. But the, the matrix uh, at least cares about one back history a lot more than striosomes. So I want to end by saying that um, it's, it's really a privilege to work on these pathways that we believe are related to challenging motivational states. It's a long time ago I thought that uh, this kind of uh, system it reminded me very much of a mixture of experts model uh, that had been worked on at the time we were doing this uh, with modulation by dopamine. Now we're looking at hierarchical learning models and using them. But I want to thank you again, and I want to bring up again these disorders. 
And the reason that I want to do this is that I think it is profoundly wonderful that we can do very basic science and care deeply about that pure science and yet always carry in our minds, carry in our minds, the possibility that that deep, pure science could be used eventually to help people. So I close by thanking the wonderful people who have worked on this so hard with us and our collaborators uh, and our funders. And uh, again, I think it's just a privilege to be a neuroscientist. Thank you.